Chapter 4, Part 1 of The Life of Henry David Thoreau by Henry Salt. Walden Pond, on the shore of which Thoreau determined to make his hermitage, is a small lake about a mile and a half south of the village of Concord, surrounded by low, thickly wooded hills. Its water, which is of a greenish-blue color, is so brilliantly transparent that the bottom is visible at a depth of thirty feet, in which respect it is unrivaled by the other ponds of the neighborhood, except by White Pond, which lies some two miles westward on the other side of the Concord River. Walden had doubtless in primitive ages been frequented by the Indians, as was testified by arrowheads discoverable on its shores, and by dim traces of a narrow shelf-like path worn by the feet of aboriginal hunters which ran round the steeply sloping bank. In the early days of the Massachusetts colony, the dense woods, which even in Thoreau's memory completely surrounded the pond, had been the haunt of fugitives and outlaws. But at a later period, the road from Concord to Lincoln, which skirts the east shore of Walden, had been dotted by the cottages and gardens of a small hamlet, and had resounded, as Thoreau tells us, with the laugh and gossip of inhabitants. Drink had been the ruin of these former settlers, and the hardy water-drinker who now came to make his home in Walden Woods took care to choose a new and unpolluted spot for his dwelling. The ground chosen by Thoreau for the building of his hut was on a woodlot belonging to Emerson, a sloping bank at the outskirts of the forest on the north shore of the pond and some thirty or forty yards from the water edge. No house could be seen from this point, the horizon being bounded by the woods on the opposite shore half a mile distant and although the village was within easy reach, and the newly constructed railway was visible on one hand and the woodland road on the other, there was no neighbor within a mile, and the solitude was usually as complete as the strictest anchorite could have desired. This position exactly suited Thoreau's requirements, since he could either pursue his meditations undisturbed or, if the mood took him, pay a visit to his friends in the village, from whose society he had no intention of permanently banishing himself. So one morning, towards the end of March 1845, when the approach of spring was already heralded by the voice of songbirds and the thawing of the ice on Walden, the bachelor of nature addressed himself to the pleasurable task of squatting on the selected spot. Having borrowed the favorite axe of his friend Alcott, who warned him that it was the apple of his eye, he began to cut down pine trees and hew the timber into shape for the frame of his hut, working leisurely each day so as to get the full enjoyment of his occupation and returning betimes to the village to sleep. After two or three weeks spent in this labor, when the house was framed and ready for raising, he dug his cellar in the sand of the sloping bank, six feet square by seven deep, and having bought the planks of a shanty belonging to an Irishman who worked on the Fitchburg Railroad, he transported them to the site of the hut. Early in May he set up the frame of his house, on which occasion, for the sake of neighborliness, as he is careful to tell us, rather than of necessity, he accepted the assistance of some of his friends, among whom were Alcott, to whom he returned the axe sharper than he had received it, George William Curtis, who was then spending a year or two at Concord, having hired himself out as an agricultural laborer, and Edmund Hosmer, one of the leading farmers of Concord, with whom Thoreau was on intimate terms. 
Footnote. In his contribution to Homes of American Authors, he refers to Thoreau's hut. One pleasant afternoon, a small party of us helped him raise it, a bit of life as Arcadian as any at Brook Farm. End footnote. The hut, which was ten feet wide by fifteen long, with a garret and a closet, a large window at the side, a door at one end, and a brick fireplace at the other, was then boarded and roofed so as to be quite rainproof, but during the summer months it remained without plastering or chimney. It was the 4th of July, or Independence Day, a significant and auspicious date for the commencement of such an undertaking, when Thoreau, who previously had been owner of no habitations but a boat and a tent, took up his residence in this house, which he could call his own property, and which, as he proudly records, had cost him but twenty-eight dollars in the building. The question of furnishing, which is a cause of such anxious consideration to so many worthy householders, was solved by Thoreau with his usual boldness and expedition. Furniture, he exclaims, in an outburst of pitying wonder at the spectacle of men who are enslaved by their own chattels, thank God I can sit and I can stand without the aid of a furniture warehouse. His furniture at Walden, which was partly of his own manufacture, consisted of a bed, a table, a desk, three chairs, a looking-glass three inches in diameter, a pair of tongs and andirons, a kettle, a skillet, and a frying-pan, a dipper, a wash-bowl, two forks and knives, three plates, one cup, one spoon, a jug for oil, a jug for molasses, and a japanned lamp. Curtains he did not need, since there were no gazers to look in on him except the sun and moon, and he had no carpet in danger of fading, nor meat and milk to be guarded from sunshine or moonbeam. When a lady offered him a mat, he declined it as being too cumbrous and troublesome an article. He preferred to wipe his feet on the sod outside his door. Finding that three pieces of limestone which lay upon his desk required to be dusted daily, he threw them out of the window, determined that if he had any furniture to dust, it should be the furniture of his mind. With a house thus organized, housework, instead of being an exhausting and ever-recurring labor, was a pleasant pastime. When my floor was dirty, I rose early, and setting all my furniture out of doors on the grass, bed and bedstead making but one budget, dashed water on the floor, and sprinkled white sand from the pond on it, and then with a broom scrubbed it clean and white, and by the time the villagers had broken their fast, the morning sun had dried my house sufficiently to allow me to move in again, and my meditations were almost uninterrupted. It was pleasant to see my whole household effects on the grass, making a little pile like a gypsy's pack, and my three-legged table, from which I did not remove the books and pen and ink, standing amidst the pines and hickories." Having thus chosen his surroundings, he was free to choose also the most congenial manner of life. He rose early and took his bath in the pond, a habit which he regarded as nothing less than a religious exercise. After the morning bath came the work, or the leisure, of the day. In the early summer, before the building was finished, he had ploughed and planted about two and a half acres of the light sandy soil in the neighborhood of his hut, the crop chiefly consisting of beans, with a few potatoes, peas, and turnips. And during this first summer at Walden, the bean field was the chief scene of his labors, 
from five o'clock till noon being the hours devoted to the work. Day after day, the travelers on the road from Concord to Lincoln would rein in their horses and pause to look with wonder on this strange husbandman, who cultivated a field where all else was wild upland, who put no manure on the soil, and continued to sow beans at a time when others had begun to hoe. Meantime, the husbandman himself was deriving from his rough matter-of-fact occupation a sort of sublime transcendental satisfaction. It was agriculture and mysticism combined to which he was devoting his bodily and mental energies. What matter if, when the pecuniary gains and losses of the season came to be estimated, he found himself with a balance of but eight dollars in his favor, which represented his year's income from the farm. Was he not less anxious and more contented than his fellow agriculturists of the village? The following season he improved on these results by cultivating only a third of an acre and using the spade instead of the plow. Whatever money was further needed for his food and personal expenses, he earned by occasional day labor in the land, for he had, as he tells us, as many trades as fingers. After a morning thus spent in work, whether manual or literary, he would refresh himself by a second plunge in the pond, and enjoy an afternoon of perfect freedom, rambling according to his wont by river or forest, wherever his inclination led him. He had also his entire days of leisure, when he could not afford to sacrifice the bloom of the present moment to any work, whether of the head or hands. Sometimes, he says, in a summer morning, having taken my accustomed bath, I sat in my sunny doorway from sunrise till noon, wrapped in a reverie amidst the pines and hickories and sumacs, in undisturbed solitude and stillness, while the birds sang around or flitted noiseless through the house, until by the sun falling in at my west window, or the noise of some traveler's wagon on the distant highway, I was reminded of the lapse of time. He was well aware that these daydreams must be accounted sheer idleness by his enterprising townsmen, but of that he himself was the best and only judge. On moonlit evenings he would walk on the sandy beach of the pond and wake the echoes of the surrounding woods with his flute. We have seen what amount of shelter Thoreau thought needful for his comfort. His estimate of what is necessary in the way of food and clothing was conceived in the same spirit. His costume was habitually coarse, shabby, and serviceable. He would wear corduroy, Channing tells us, but not shoddy. His drab hat, battered and weather-stained, his clothes often torn and as often mended, his dusty cowhide boots all told of hard service in field and forest, and of the unwillingness of the wearer to waste a single dollar on the vanities of outward appearance. He wished his garments to become assimilated to himself, and to receive a true impress of his character. He would not be like some king or nobleman, a wooden horse on which clean clothes might be hung for a day's ornament. His diet was fully as simple and economical as his clothing. His food, while he stayed at Walden, consisted of rice, Indian meal, potatoes, and very rarely salt pork, and his drink was water. He baked his own bread of rye and Indian meal, at first procuring yeast from the village, but afterwards coming to the conclusion that it was simpler and more respectable to omit the process of leavening. He had a strong preference at all times for a vegetarian diet, 
though he would occasionally catch a mess of fish for his dinner from Walden Pond, and pleads guilty on one occasion to having slaughtered and devoured a woodchuck which made inroads on his beanfield. Here is an anecdote of Thoreau by one who visited him at Walden. One of the axioms of his philosophy had been to take the life of nothing that breathed, if he could avoid it. But it had now become a serious question with him whether to allow the woodchucks and rabbits to destroy his beans or to fight. Having determined on the latter, he procured a steel trap and soon caught a venerable old fellow to the manor born, and who had held undisputed possession there for all time. After retaining the enemy of all beans, Endurance Ville, for a few hours, he pressed his foot on the spring of the trap and let him go, expecting and hoping never to see him again. Vain delusion. A few days later, on returning from the village post office and looking in the direction of his bean field, to his disgust and apprehension, he saw the same old gray back disappear behind some brush just outside the field. Accordingly, he set the trap and again caught the thief. Now it so happened that those old knights of the shotgun, Hook and Line, Wesson, Pratt and Company, were on a piscatorial visit to the pond. A council of war was thereupon held to determine what should be done with the woodchuck. A decision was rendered immediately by the landlord of the Middlesex Hotel in his terse and laconic manner. Knock his brains out! This, however, was altogether too severe on the woodchuck, thought Henry. Even woodchucks had some rights that squatter sovereigns should respect. Was he not the original occupant there? And had not he jumped the woodchuck's claim, destroyed his home, and built the hut upon the ruins? After considering the question carefully, he took the woodchuck in his arms and carried him some two miles away, and then, with a severe admonition at the end of a good stick, he opened the trap and again let him depart in peace, and he never saw him more. Footnote. Some Recollections and Incidents Concerning Thoreau by Joseph Hosmer. End footnote. In November, when the summer weather was ended and frost coming on apace, he put the finishing touches to his house by shingling its sides, building a fireplace and chimney, and finally plastering the walls. Hardly was this last process over when the winter set in with full severity, and by the middle of December the pond was completely frozen and the ground covered with snow. He now began, in the full sense, to inhabit his hermitage, his outdoor employments being limited to collecting and chopping firewood, while during the long evening hours he occupied himself with the journal which he still kept with unfailing regularity, and which formed the basis of his Walden and the week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, the latter of which was now in course of preparation. Now, too, he had full leisure to weigh the respective merits of society and solitude. Of the solitude thus offered him, he availed himself with gratitude and profit. It was during this period that he matured his thoughts and perfected his literary style, so that having come to Walden with still somewhat of the crudeness of youth, he might leave it with the firmness and dignity of manhood. In this connection may be quoted the pleasant stanzas of the winter walk, written at Walden, though at a somewhat earlier date. When winter fringes every bough with his fantastic wreath and puts the seal of silence now upon the leaves beneath. When every stream in its pent house goes gurgling on its way 
and in his gallery the mouse nibbleth the meadow hay. Methinks the summer still is nigh, and lurketh underneath. As that same meadow mouse doth he snug in that last year's heath. Eager I hasten to the vale, as if I heard brave news, how nature held high festival, which it were hard to lose. I gamble with my neighbor ice and sympathizing quake, as each new crack darts in a trice across the gladsome lake. One with the cricket in the ground and faggot on the hearth, resounds the rare domestic sound along the forest path. End of chapter 4, part 1